All right, folks, welcome back to the Pangburn Hangout. I am Travis Pangburn, and today we're going to be having a conversation with Dr. Roman Yampolsky. He has a very impressive CV. Um, very much related to the world of AI. Um, his newest book is AI Safety and Security. Um, so, in a way, kind of in the front lines of the battle of the battlefield against AI, trying to keep up. And he's uh, got a book called Artificial Super Intelligence: A Futuristic Approach. It's two hundred and six dollars for the hardcover. Yikes! That's expensive. We are going to be on video on call in. I'm going to give you guys the link. Uh, those of you who are going to be joining us on YouTube, in case you want to call in and ask a question and engage in some back and forth with uh, Dr. Yampolsky. Yeah, we want to hear your best uh, questions, your best and brightest questions relating to computer science and AI today. So um, let me give you guys the link. If you're not familiar with Call-In yet, Call-In is a new social podcasting app. It's brilliant. It's a beautiful app developed by, well, speaking from a top-down perspective, David Sachs, billionaire David Sachs. Uh, we are so happy to be partnered up with them in helping them develop this new app. Um, we are kind of at the forefront of the app. We were the first <clears throat> show to be given... Uh, access to the brand new video feature, which we will be showing off here today during this uh, live discussion and Q&A session. I know this is not the an optimal time to be doing a live stream, but uh, those of you who do stop by here, at the channel. Uh, thank you for stopping by and taking the time. And uh, remember to subscribe if you haven't yet. There is a podcast that exists in my first uh, conversation with Dr. Yampolsky. He came on the podcast about a year or so ago. It's probably two years, but the older I get, the more I lose track of time. Is that something that AI can somehow solve? Who knows? Maybe Dr. Roman knows. All right. Thomas Panter of Thomas Torture Time, one of the shows on the Pangburn Network, has just informed me that the show is live. So let's, let's connect. testing hey brother testing. can you hear me i can can you hear me oh definitely excellent sounding sexy as ever oh i'm i'm going for that now you're like three times louder okay hang on i don't know what happened there which isn't necessarily a bad thing but is this is this better that's a little softer on the ears but maybe the audience can okay. let us know uh how the balance is out there. Guys, we are starting a little it. bit uh, earlier here just so people have a chance to get into the room. We didn't want anyone to miss out on this awesome discussion and Q&A that we are going to be having with Dr. Uh, Roman Yampolsky today, who is a specialist in the field of AI and computer science. Are you pumped, Thomas? I am. I've been studying a lot. I fucking love it when you study. Mm, I do too. Oh, yeah, study it. Study. Uh, are you going to yep. turn your camera on or are you going to hide? I'm hiding, dude. Fucking pussy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, so I was, um, 
I was on the ice last night for the first time in three years. Did you uh, body check some some fools? I actually, my first shift, honestly, I got into a little bit of a tiff with a guy because, <laughs> like, you know, he's wearing a blue helmet. I knew he was their best player, and I kind of pinned him a little bit after the play against the boards, and I, I told him I was going to be watching him all night. <laughs> <laughs> i'm watching you bro my uh gal after the game was like were you bullying that man <laughs> oh my god and i was like no that's just part of the game well i guess i kind of was because bullying is part of the sport you know it really I is mean, seems to me i know fuck all about hockey so i mean you gotta win what are we, what are we gonna do just like not win just uh, pick the puck up with your hands and throw it in there. Yeah, just pick the puck. Pull a gun out. Shoot pull anyone that out. gets in your way. <laughs> and then put the puck in the net with your... The goalie's whatever. not going to fuck with you. The goalie's no, just going to No, shoot leave. him dead. Shoot it's all about dead. winning. <sighs> yeah. How does this somehow relate to... Just uh, one dude brings a gun, and then he's the hockey champion. Exactly. Why isn't anyone doing this? That's bad advertisement. Don't oh yeah, it's this, against way, it, it's against the law. Right? <laughs> we don't do, do this not against kill against for all these people. For all these guts. people who are like, yeah, there shouldn't be laws for shit like this. It's like, really? <laughs> are you still there, Thomas? Check check. Can everyone hear me? Oh, man. I think I got disconnected. I think I uh, disconnected myself. Oh. It's okay. Yeah, I'm, a, his, I'm a new. His name is Roman. Yeah, I believe so. We could say <laughs> okay. Ro Roman. No, he's Russian. Yeah, I could he's say, Russian. So. so should I say Roman or Roman? <laughs> I'm just gonna I got to get this clear. I'm, I'm gonna ask him. I'm, I'm just, just gonna, gonna be like, how should I Yeah, I, I just I have this morbid uh curiosity related to how you will say it and how that will turn out for you. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna say it at first. I'm just gonna be like, What how should I refer to you? Like Doctor Roman Just say Doctor Yum. Do Yumplowski. Just say doctor. Doctor, doctor. Yeah, I could just be doctor, like doctor. Doctor, give me the news. I got a bad case of killing. But I mean, he's just a dude like anybody else. Know what I'm saying? Know what I'm saying? Is this a self soothing technique you're going through right now because you're a yes. little nervous? Yes. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I fucking love it. Absolutely. When he does get into the room, let's just send him an invite. Up here. All right. Okay. I'm waiting to see. I do not see. But it's only 157, so. Oh, yeah. We got time. It's all good. Again, hello to everyone on YouTube who does th stop by. If you do enjoy this video that we are creating, please drop a like and consider subscribing. Because we rock. And you can rock, too, if you sign up. Enter your credit card number now. Yes. And the three digits on the back, of course. Yes, we need that too, please. Uh, those of you, hello, Nivik, Salman, Amy, Victor. Guys, feel free to invite your favorite call-in friends to the room. I know this is not the optimal time of day to be doing this, but, um, well, for some people it is, actually. Salman's probably yeah. like, finally! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that earlier. He's he's loving it. Now, we're not going to dox Salman to say where he's from. No. But they make really good fish and chips there. <laughs> Travis Pangburn is deceptive. I think so. I'm, I'm running an ad campaign based on that. Uh, good. Well, let's call it a smear <laughs> campaign. I like it, when, I like it better okay. when they call it smear. Yeah, it sounds sexier. Smear is just so sexy. It's the sexiest term. Mm -hmm. Hey, come smear me. <laughs> Get me moist. Oh, yeah. Me moist me with smear. 
Smear me with moist. That's uh, pretty gross. If he comes in here and the first thing he hears was is smear me with moist, I'm sure he's just going <laughs> to log out. <laughs> or, or he'll just turn on his cam and be like, I am smeared. I wish he'd be like that. That would be more. That would be my. Can you imagine favorite. if he came on with like a robot hat or mask on, or and a he... tinfoil hat on. <laughs> that would be my favorite if he had a tinfoil hat. Dude, I would love to just wear a tinfoil hat on here one time and not make no mention of it with a guest, <laughs> like a really high profile guest. Yeah, <laughs> and just see if they ask. Just be like, be so, like, well, uh, I'm trying to block the signals from bernie sanders so it's like yeah what do you want sanders in your mind (laughs) (laughs) sanders illuminati (laughs) whoever Uh, pizzagate old oh my god (laughs) yeah pizzagate (laughs) Uh, that's my first question to him i'm just gonna be like hey man what do you think about pizzagate rebel science on youtube says hey from riga roman is also from riga Amazing scientist he is. Thanks for uh, having him on. You bet, Rebel Science. Consider subscribing to the YouTube channel. Uh, more importantly, click that link just above your comment and join us on call in. You can actually talk to Roman Yampolsky uh, today. And if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, I shall forever we be We shall shamed. see in the future. We'll find out. I think I called, I, I think that's what I called him, and he was fine with it when i had him on my podcast by the way if you guys want to uh check out my one-on-one podcast with dr roman um head over to youtube.com forward slash pangburn and just search his name and you'll find it we had a really good conversation about two years ago i think i'm excited and honored to speak to someone who's had his training you have had your training thomas Oh, my entire in the, life. In the Thomas torture way. Yes. Beat it till it's dead and dead again. Beat it. And again and again and again. And again. And again and again and again and again. <laughs> I'm just going to see if he's messaged me on Twitter. Uh, he's all good. I mean, if he takes a while to show up, it's all oh, good. Yeah, I, no. I mean, how long does he want to stay? Is it like hour? Oh, we have like, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, an hour or so. Okay. He'll let us know. Uh, yeah, I mean, he can leave whenever I assume. Yeah, these hangouts, still wanna... you know, these hangout conversations with, you know, famous folks can be just that. We're hanging out. Yeah. Oh, I've got questions to ask. Oh, I've got questions. I do, too. I even wrote them down on my little uh, notepad. I did not write them down because I wanted it to be freeform. Uh, oh, so you want to be some... better than me. I get it. Yeah, I'm, I'm already better than you, so it's not, it's yeah. not a, a, a debate. I agree. Here. I agree. We don't have to debate that. <laughs> I agree. I do agree. Oh, good. My plan has come to fruition. My plan has come. See if he's messaged me. I'm reading shit. Cool. As always. You're always reading, studying. What drives you, Thomas? Pleasure. Yeah, I agree. That's that's the end of the show, folks. Thank you for joining us. (laughs) We both agree that pleasure drives us. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Rock and or roll. Why oh, do by you the do way, that? because I want to. <laughs> by the way, if you ever want to really trigger Thomas here, who is a very even keel, smooth guy, full of empathy. Oh, don't if you even ever, say it. If you Go ever want to tri- if you ever want to trigger him, just <sighs> just give your musical opinion in the comment section. Like say God like your fa- like for me, I like to tell him that like Elton John is the king of music. You know, and <laughs> and, and, and you know he he'll let out a laugh i don't hate elton john bro i know you don't hate him but you don't believe him to be the king no (laughs) (laughs) i just want to get you all triggered up before uh Uh, if you want to get me triggered yeah that's probably the easiest way to do it but i mean i'm just gonna something just do uh, my thing like started up what was that something with russian writing what was that (laughs) 
something just happened to my computer that is sus. shut the fuck up salmon sus uh, yeah what did what did salmon say he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Taylor Swift is the best. What are you talking about? True that. I don't even know if this is a Taylor Swift song. You what about change my mind? Like <laughs> a girl changes clothes. I'm uh I can trigger Travis <laughs> back by saying reason and guides me. <laughs> Maybe like, you're all emotion, man. That's all you are. <laughs> That's all you are, bro. I'm going to go ahead, uh, Salmon, and say Taylor, not so swift. Taylor, well, we could say Taylor, Taylor, uh, Taylor has issues. Can that say, oh, uh, let me see. He's asking for the active link. Let me go uh, here and here. Aha! Welcome, welcome. Let me get back to my screen here. I don't know what that's that's doing all of a sudden. Oh, did I move it down here? I did. Mm -hmm. All right, we can invite. Um, uh, Dr. Roman, we're going to, you'll see a little invite box. Um. Just it should pop up at the top of your screen. Ah, there we go. Perfect. And you should be able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. If you have an active cam. All right, there we go. All right. Nice. It doesn't take super intelligence to figure out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to see you again. Uh, Likewise. Welcome back. Uh, how have things been going? What have you been working on recently? Fill us in. Uh, more of the same, you know, fighting Terminators. <laughs> fighting <about> Skynet. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thomas, did you want to go with your uh, introduction here and then we can get into it? Well, I would love to. Um, it's an honor, Doctor. How would you like me to respond? Um, refer to you, sir? Would you think Dr. Roman would be fine or Roman? Doesn't have to be a doctor, just Roman. Okay, Roman, it's nice to meet you. I'm Thomas Panter. I'm going to tell the audience about your credentials just so they know who you are and and kind of what you're about. Um, so, guys, Dr. Roman is a tenured associate professor at the Department of Computer Engineering and Computer Science at the Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville. So he is the founding and current director of Cy- <clears throat> Cybersecurity Lab and an author of many books, uh, which I'm intending to read, uh, including Artificial Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach. Uh, now, I don't know if this is true or not. Are you working on the book AI Safety and Security, or is that something that is already out? That baby is right here. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Excellent. So, guys in the audience, I'm going to go ahead and say that he holds a PhD from <clears throat> the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Buffalo in 2008. He was the recipient of the four-year NSF and uh, IG, I don't know this acronym, uh, IGERT uh, fellowship before beginning his doctoral studies. Uh, Dr. Yumpolsky received a bachelor's uh, in high, a BSMS, high honors, combined degree in computer science from Rochester Institute of Technology. After completing this, uh, his after completing his PhD dissertation, Dr. Roman held a position of an affiliate ag- academic at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, University of London, College of London. Okay, so his main areas of interest are AI safety, which I'm very interested in, artificial intelligence, GAI, which I am very, very interested in, uh, behavioral biometrics, cybersecurity. Uh, I had to do a lot of that in school, so I'm interested. Uh, digital forensics, uh, games, I guess, and game theory, genetic algorithms, and pattern recognition, which is a huge topic in uh, intelligence and G, uh, GAI. Uh, AGI, excuse me. I, I said that wrong. G, it's AGI. Uh, his research has been uh, cited by a thousand plus scientists and profiled in popular magazines. So we really, we really owe him thanks for working on this field and, and attempting to push it further. Uh, I'd like to plug a couple more of his books. Um, He has, as I spoke, Artificial Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach. 
He has game strategy, a novel uh, behavioral biometric. He has computer security from passwords to behavioral biometrics. And he has feature extraction ap approaches for op uh, optical character recognition. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that Dr. Roman is involved in, and I, I implore you to go check all of it out. So, uh, Travis, did you? And want I, to say I was just going to say, I assume that you know, if I'm making a password for myself uh, for one of my accounts on the internet, Pangburn one two three would probably not be a good password. Is that correct, Dr. Roman? It depends. So there is usually three levels of access, right? You have your accounts you don't care about, and that would be a great password for. <laughs> you have your accounts where you care enough, but it's not very important if it gets hacked. And finally, you have your Bitcoin account where you want to make sure you know your private keys are secure. Yeah, that sounds good. I what, agree. And Thomas, what did you want to get into first here? Oh, man. God. Dr. Roman, I have so many questions, but I didn't want to do it in a question format. Let's just take it easy and we'll we'll talk about some things that I'm interested in. Um, OK. So can you tell me what intellectuology intellectual intellectuality is? Can can you can you uh, tell me about that and how it's different than the study, you know, of the philosophy of mind into intelligence or uh, AGI in general? Right. So a lot of different fields have interest in intelligence. Computer science studies artificial intelligence. We have cognitive science, psychology, philosophy mm -hmm. of mind. All of those fields have their own terminology, their own tools, different mm -hmm. theories. It, it would make sense to combine it all under a single umbrella where things like developing artificial minds, AI research, would be a subdomain. And I love you that. Have general questions of how do you detect intelligence? How do you measure intelligence? Mm -hmm. uh, what is produced by intelligent entities versus, you know, evolves naturally or randomly generated? Mm -hmm. so all these questions. So that was just an idea for kind of creating this new umbrella term for everyone working in the field. I think it's brilliant. And um, I, I too want the same thing. I want, you know, a grand unified theory of artificial intelligence where we can pull from all these informations. What do you think, I guess, explain to the audience. Uh, so AGI is artificial general intelligence. It's different than uh, artificial intelligence in general. If you, if you guys in the audience want to think about artificial intelligence, you can think of things like, you know, I have my notes, guys. I don't want to be incorrect. You know, um, one second. So AI applications like web searches, Google, uh, recommendation systems such as YouTube and Amazon, uh, understanding human speech like Siri and Alexa, self-driving cars like Tesla, uh, automated decision-making things, strategic game systems like uh, chess and AlphaGo and things like that. Those are all systems that are considered, at least within the, the computer science realm, to be um, weak AI. I wanted to ask you, Dr. Roman, do you think strong AI is possible? Yes. I do too. This is what I want to get into here. Yes. And how and and what do we need to make this happen, Dr. Roman? Or do we yes. have that answer? It looks like at this point we just need a lot of money to get a lot of compute. We have uh, finally gotten to an architecture which seems to scale. Uh, there is something called scalability hypothesis, which basically says if we continue on this uh, approach with enough compute, enough data, we will scale current very deep neural networks to to the mm. size and capability of human brain. Would you would you agree with someone like Dr. Stephen Wolfram? I'm, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Wolfram and Wolfram physics, but he, he's talking about when he talks about things like consciousness, like the, like the difference between you know intelligence and non intelligence. He would talk about trying to find that fundamental rule that is operating at the basis of uh, intelligent computation or conscious computation. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that? Do you think there is a rule sitting underneath all that, that as long as we s implement that rule, uh, w we will maybe perhaps start seeing AI? It, it might be hard to differentiate between AI and, and a human mind. So I worked with Dr. Wolfram. He's very cool. big in uh, cellular automata, and then yep. he refers to one oh, rule, yes. or basic rule. He would talk about generating uh, interesting non-trivial, non-random patterns 
of cell or automata. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned consciousness, which is another term which is not necessarily needed for very capable, generally intelligent systems. Uh, it seems that what we found is uh, architecture modeled on human neural networks, which are very repetitive. Uh, brain is a lot of same modules repeated over and over. And that seems to be generally sufficient to recognize patterns in music and text and vision. Uh, so if you scale it enough, uh, at least so far, we haven't seen it stopped improving. So it continues to get better and better. Mm, mm. Language models are pretty much at level of human text generation. Uh, yeah. Face recognition, vision, all are getting very impressive. In many domains, a super human capability. So yeah. uh, I don't know specifically uh, if he's trying to emulate any of these processes as a cellular automata. Uh, it's possible that there is a specific rule which generates that type of neural network. There is interesting research at the intersection of neural networks and cellular automata. Right. Well, uh, as well as evolutionary algorithms to evolve those systems. But th <clears throat> that seems to be unnecessary. That's a specific type of model you can look at. Um, yeah, I think, I think there there's strong evidence that what human minds are fundamentally doing is a self-serving hedonistic calculus. And I think, um, you know, what my hypothesis that I propose in my second book is that we are pleasure drives. And I think if we embed a pleasure drive into a robot or a machine of, of some kind uh, and allow it to grow uh, with that fundamental rule playing, I think that is the Wolfram rule that he is looking for. I think it really is a hedonistic calculus. I, I, I think that's what the evidence shows us in, in uh, cognition. If that was true, wouldn't you get stuck in just uh, pleasure loops? Wouldn't you be on drugs all the time? I think we do. I think I think we have tendencies towards that. Like, I, I don't think everyone has the genetic predisposition uh, to fall into drug abuse. But uh, I would say, you know, <clears throat> up in Canada, most people I know overuse alcohol. It, when I say overuse yeah. based on the doctoral standards of, okay, if you're having more than one or two drinks a week... Uh, they would say, you know, you're 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 taking in too much of that. You know, that that pleasure drive is acting antithetically against your well-being. Well, we definitely all want pleasure, but I think most of us are strong enough to not fall into this wireheading type of uh, loop. And I agree. Happiness yep. is of two types: uh, hedonistic pleasures, and then some sort of a meaningful actions getting to an important goal and you need both mm -hmm. but i would say those meaningful actions dr roman are also pleasurable pursuits there you know the in these when we're when we're finding great pleasure in empathy for others empathy for ourselves and things like that i guess in my second book i am categorizing that those in the pleasure hierarchy and in the pleasurable pursuits as well i find it hard to escape that when i do this reductive uh you know, uh, infiltration into what's going on. I just find that, uh, you know, whether it be the pleasurable pursuit of, of giving your absolute empathy to your child or, you know, anything else or, or sacrificing yourself for the greater good of your country, things like this, I do think it's fundamentally a pleasure calculus. And I, I, I'm still doing more work on this and I have some field studies to do and, and some things with Stephen that I, that I want to uh, work on. But uh, yeah, I do, I do want to see how these, you know, what would happen if we do uh, mimic some kind of hedonistic pleasure calculus that's partnered with, uh, you know, some kind of generalized, um, emp uh, you know, empathy like like we have we seem to all have some level of empathy minus the one percent who uh, don't get pleasure out of this but it, if yeah. you abstract it as a reward that's what neural networks do they try to maximize uh, mm -hmm. reward uh, for accurate recognition of patterns mm -hmm. mm. Mm. indeed that is what the neural networks are are used for as far as i've studied mm. yeah uh Okay, uh, I don't want to take up. Uh, go ahead, Thomas. Oh no, you're fine. Um, all that was in, uh, was interesting because I wanted to get his uh, ethical viewpoints. I think me and Dr. Roman agree a lot. So here's <clears throat> here's a something you can tell me, Dr. Roman. You know, there's wide agreement 
there's wide disagreement among the artificial intelligence community. Of course, you know that, but there is wide agreement that that intelligence has to at least require the following. So, reason, like you know, using strategy, solving puzzles, making judgments under uncertainty. Uh, they have to represent knowledge, you know, including like general natural language, like natural language, common sense knowledge, uh, planning, learning, and uh, integrating all these skills into a whole. W- would you say that those that those would constitute some kind of intelligence? There's all important properties, and people can add another fifty to it. There is never a kind of limit of uh, what we think is required for intelligence or what intelligence is capable of doing there mm-hmm. is an interesting paper which kind of surveyed all those different definitions in the hopes of coming up with a very short rule kind of explaining what it is and they basically said intelligence is ability to win in any environment so if mm. i play you in a stock market situation you make money if you're on mars you can navigate general capability of winning so that seems like that's a very abstract, short way of saying all the things you suggested. Right. So the big thing for me there would be uncertainty, making decisions, quote unquote, under uncertainty. So I, that's, you know, having having autonomy uh, or even such a, a mental construct as imagination. Could could that, that be something that you you could imagine that you <laughs> that you could uh, see happening? It's happening already. Have you seen AI generated art? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, I, I love wanted it. to get into that. Yeah, that's way yeah, more creative than any human artist I've seen, especially modern art. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and so, and uh, is this going to make like is this going to discourage human beings from doing art eventually, or are they or is it more just going to be something you do at your own uh, leisure? So by analogy, we can see other domains where AI is better. Chess, for example. Human chess still exists. It's popular. People enjoy it. But all of them are terrible compared to the best computers. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So I guess the next question is, what are your favorite tests for confirming AGI? Uh, Turing test, obviously. Wozniak's test. Goertzel's test. Nielsen's test. What What do you think would be a better test than those? Well, I, I don't look at it that way. I don't think okay. a test is what going to convince us. Turing test was a gold standard for a long time. I think arguably mm-hmm. large language models are passing it every day today and nothing has changed. So it's more about uh, what can you do with this system? Can it design another system? Can it do engineering? Can it do science? Mm-hmm. Those are the mm-hmm. interesting capabilities. Tests are by definition kind of limited in what they can measure so you can always game them cheat in some way get a restricted narrow system which is passing the test but is not general right right it's that uh it's that weak ai so complex that it can fool us into thinking that it is agi right there is also interesting distinction between general intelligence and human level intelligence we consider ourselves general because in a domain of interest for humans we know how to do those things but outside of that domain we are really terrible so if you think about intelligence capabilities of some animals or ai they can do things no human can do so a truly general system would be intelligent in all those domains whereas we are just human level intelligent which is a much lower uh, capability. You can think of that future AGI as a universal intelligence. So I, I do th- sometimes think when I hear this term machine learning, I sometimes think like, how do we know we are not just an advanced form of machine learning that is so advanced that is indistinguishable from what we would call, you know, uh, intelligence or you know, whatever we're trying to say is beyond machine learning. How would we distinguish between the two? So you're asking, are we just robots? Are, are we, we just- not? Are we are we not just hyper advanced? Uh, you know, and, and I'm thinking about determinism, the, the deterministic causal chain of events that seems to, uh, you know, cause everything that is going on right now. Um, I don't our, think we're that advanced. That's the thing. We actually well, sure. Terrible like, if you think about it, like yeah. I can remember seven items, seven. 
Right. That's insanely bad. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. I mean, I agree. I agree with you on that. But doesn't isn't that just more evidence maybe that we are uh, machine learning? Just like some, you know, higher level than, you know, an ant. So it's learning. It uh, doesn't matter what uh, substrate is implementing it. It's the same algorithms. You have gradual, a gradual descent, and you reward uh, good performance. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, uh, mach machine machine okay. learning is used in email filtering, speech recognition, computer vision, things like that. So, I mean, it's also on that level of the weaker, you know, more focused AIs that do specific tasks. As far as I've read. Hey, Thomas, I was thinking, let's maybe bring Lexicon in. I'm sure he's got a question. We'll take our first caller. If that's sure, all right. go right ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to do that because uh, I don't have mod, uh, mod power. Uh, uh -huh. Welcome, Lexicon. Hello. Are you there, Lexicon? I Check hope I'm here. Okay, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Just speak up into your mic. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't realize how quiet my mic would be. Um... I just had a question about uh, his opinion posed by, because uh, like most people are writing these AIs in things like Python and other uh, other languages, other than like the basic languages that we use to like make Windows and stuff. What's his opinion on the potential threat posed by hostile actors um, mispurposing administrative level AIs that have access to like the passwords of the system and options to like turn machines on and off so malevolent ai where someone on purpose makes a system which has a harmful goal of some kind harmful payload is the hardest problem anything we can do to make ai safe if there is a malevolent actor someone on the inside who wants to undo that uh, there is not much we can do you can always bribe people, blackmail them into doing what a malevolent actor wants. So I have a few papers specifically on that topic, kind of pointing out that it is strictly the worst, worst case scenario. Yeah. I agree. That's a good question. That's what I was going to cover too, asking about AI safety. Uh, can, can you elaborate a bit, uh, Dr. Roman, on, on like blocking on what that would be? And what? Blocking. AI blocking. As in, like, uh, you make reference to, if I'm, if I'm correct here, correct me if I'm wrong, but it says you make, a, your co you and your collaborator, Trazi, I can't, if I'm pronouncing his name correct, uh, have proposed introducing Achilles heels into oh, the Oh, our official stupidity paper, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Maybe it's kind of like what I said um, with humans. We can only remember seven things. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like an artificial uh, limiter edit, like where general intelligence is in somebody said, mm, let's make sure they're not too powerful. Let's put in place all these limits. So the idea is the same, but for AI. So they are at the same level as us in terms of uh, communicating with us, collaborating. They are not too capable, which mm -hmm. makes it more difficult for consumers, more, more unsafe. So we wanted to kind of list those uh, human limitations, capabilities, and uh, kind of create a standard data set uh, where people can look up what capabilities to give AI if you want it to stay at the human level, not go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. Lexicon, did you have something else you wanted to ask, Bob? Yeah, I, I was just, um, I was just specifically, I'm specifically concerned with the um, security flaws, essentially, of taking a uh, I don't know if it's higher or lower, but a different like um, level of programming language and giving it control over a more base level of programming language. So like having Python tell C++ to do something, is there risks here where somebody could say you have an AI written in one language and because it's written in that language, you can get it to do things with another language? Like I'm thinking of like attacks directed at the AI itself to get it to do something that would cause it to have a negative reaction. Not necessarily that the AI would be um, actively malevolent, like someone going by the system would be like, oh, it's making bad decisions. 
I mean something along the lines of like you have an AI that's monitoring an R, you know, the RPMs of a centrifuge, and you give it a command and it displays the wrong measurement, something like that. So that can happen. I, I don't fully understand why the programming language would make any difference in what you programmed it in and what is uh, it interfaces with. That's not a fact. Well, I'm worried about the AI interface because um, I'm seeing people. Uh, typically use AIs um, in machine learning for um, input commands. And I'm concerned with it being a case of where it becomes a system we don't have people monitor monitoring like at all. It's kind of like a, a walk away and forget, a replacement for somebody in the field doing something. So the last year I spent a lot of time looking at different limits of what we can do in the safety space. And it, it seems there are very specific limits on explainability, explaining how the system works, how it makes decisions, predictability, predicting what the system will do, what decisions it will make, and general control. So I, I think uh, we just don't know how the systems work. They are so complex, we don't fully comprehend not just how they make decisions, but what they are capable of. Uh, good examples are with language models we discovered they can play chess, they can speak French. None of it was built in at the time the system was designed. So I think our ability to monitor those systems is non-existent. Right. Mm. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Lexicon. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank the, you, only, the only oh, other yeah, question sure. I, I wanted to ask yeah. you was, um, when it comes to AIs eventually um, writing their own programming languages, um, do you think it's going to have the potential of that exponential scale that some people claim? So AIs, writing AIs to make even better AIs, even faster than we could do it ourselves. Yeah, Mo Moore's Law on steroids, is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah, recursive self-improvement uh, is likely to be possible and be very fast, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I agree. That's all I got for uh, now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you, man. Thank you for the good questions. Thanks, Lexicon. Uh, we have one of the most... He's uh, one of my friends, Salman, who has uh, taken artificial intelligence in school, at least a few classes. Uh, I think he has some wonderful questions, and I really want to hear from him. So I'm going to shut up and let Salman come in and get these really good questions out. Fire away, Salman. How are you? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, uh, Dr. Roman, uh, thank you for all the work you do. Uh, my question is, uh, one of the concerns that I have is when I hear people becoming so alarmist about AI systems becoming so advanced is that I think there is an assumption that I rarely hear much evidence for, which is that AI, as, as it becomes more and more advanced and more and more intellectually capable, it will somehow develop its own goals. And this to me seems like an unjustified assumption. Why would an AI system develop goals that are not derivable from the goals that were designed in, its, in the design phase? So why do people get into the science fiction? What if they become evil? What if their goals become anti-human and all of that? So what is this based on? Do you think that this has some any founding? So, so usually the concern is that the goals you give the system will be followed. The problem is how does the system get there? There is uh, infinitely many ways to achieve almost any goal, and most of those are very human unfriendly. The side effects are terrible. So if I have this very benign AI and I say, I want a world where you know nobody has cancer. Okay, that seems reasonable, but one way to do it is to exterminate humanity. <laughs> if you consider that option, no, it's stupid. You would never think of that. But to AI, it makes just as much sense as any other path. Mm. Then maybe, maybe is the direction is to uh, make unvague goals, very specific goals, uh, rather than generalized vague goals that can lead the computer system to do its thing in uncontrollable, uncontrollable ways. Yes, if you can figure out how to make unvague goals, you'll get a couple Nobel Prizes and a Fields Medal. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a challenge. 
Uh, doctor, I think another question is where do you see, uh, given the challenges that we are to discussing today, the numerous challenges with AI, do you think the, the better way forward is centralization? You talked about limiting AI systems and ma dumbing them down, like let's say how we're limited in our working memory capacity. Do you think we can achieve this by centralization and regulating AI systems and who gets to work on them? Or do you think it's the opposite direction by making it publicly open source available to everyone uh, cheaply so that if, if any power becomes uh, out of hand, it becomes too distributed uh, with, with as many people as possible. So it becomes uh, more manageable, let's say. Which direction is better? So this would depend on uh, how difficult a problem is, and we don't really know. If it's something where it's as uh, resource intensive as Manhattan Project, you need trillions of dollars of compute, then government regulation may be meaningful. If it turns out it's actually much easier, you can do it in a laptop in your garage, then government regulation is kind of meaningless. Historically with technology, if you think about it, spam is illegal, computer viruses are illegal, copying copyrighted software is illegal, makes no difference. So regulation doesn't help. Uh, mm -hmm. I would uh, suspect that uh, with progress in uh, compute, it becomes easier and easier for any company, any individual, any company uh, in a foreign country to get there without requiring trillions of dollars. So I, I think uh, having a legal system which limits research would not help and uh, centralizing it just is not feasible, even if it made sense. Uh, of course, if you manage to do it, now you have a problem. Who controls this one right. super powerful AI project? Right. Yes. Would you think it would um, originate at the Pentagon? Um, NSA, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah. I agree. Um, I, I was going to ask you a good question, and I forgot it. Um, I guess. units of memory, what do you expect? <laughs> yeah, we only have said. Uh, okay, yeah, I remember my question now. Um, you know IBM's quantum computer, right? Size of a car, they have to cool it down to like almost absolute zero to get the processor to work. Have you heard of this? I heard of it. I don't know many details. Okay. Do you computer. think, I mean, with, with the limited knowledge that you and, have, uh, you and I have of quantum computing, I imagine, do you think that multivariable uh, calculation power that it has might be able to replicate uh, human neurons and synapse patterns? It is not obvious if human brain relies on quantum capabilities or not. Some people say yes, but so far everything we're doing with classic uh, von Neumann architecture seems to work just as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do it better, faster with quantum. We don't have quantum computers capable of that yet. Yeah. So for now, we're just going to progress with that uh, scaling hypothesis relying on existing architecture. Okay, classical computing and things like that. Go ahead, Sama. Um, oh. My last yes, my last question, doctor, is on your behavioral biometrics area of work. Uh, with the increase of behavioral biometrics and, uh, and the advantages they can bring, but. Uh, uh, my concern is the risk they they come with with privacy and uh, if if the bi behavioral biometrics replace traditional biometrics uh, i i'm afraid that we're going to live in a world where privacy is going to be even more and more difficult to achieve so what are your thoughts on that uh, absolutely in fact you probably already don't have much privacy if you're actually active on the internet uh, the concept of privacy is uh, changing shifting what was considered uh, you know 20 years ago completely unacceptable today hey here's a picture of my lunch the whole world gets to see it uh, as long as everyone is in the same boat it's not uh, just you who is exposed in that way then people usually don't mind it so much so if all of us uh, have our typing patterns exposed i think it's not the worst thing in the world but uh, i don't think it's possible to be part of uh, society with all the surveillance cameras, with all the internet trackers, and have any expectations of privacy in that domain. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that was an excellent question, Salman. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Salman. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Uh, looks like we have our Nevekian unit the coming Nivekian in here. Nevekian unit has called yeah. in. Yeah. All right, Nevek. Now what, what I, I need to I need to say this to Doctor Roman first before we speak to the Nevekian unit. We all suspect because we've never seen the Nevekian unit on camera. Uh, he refuses to turn on his camera ever. We suspect that he might be the first AI. Uh, you know, in here, in this world learning. But I, I mean, I guess you'll be the ultimate judge of that. But uh... So a side story to that. Uh, maybe five years ago, we published a paper on physics with about 30 collaborators. Yesterday, I learned that one of them was an AI. Well, it might be Nivik here. So <laughs> we'll see. Nivik, what do you got, brother? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was curious about your view of the metaverse and what you think its potentials are. And uh, do you think it should be centralized or kind of like open source? What was the second part of the question? So metaverse, wondering, centralized, wondering, what was in the middle? I was wondering about your views of the metaverse. Uh, what do you think its potentials are? It's it. Oh. Uh, so there is a it, very it's kind of like I guess it's kind of like a matrix, kind of like uh, it's, 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 I guess it's like a upgrade of the current internet and where people Yeah, I know what it is. I was just oh, making sure sorry, I got sorry. your question. So there is a very difficult problem in AI safety. Uh, we want uh, AI systems which are value aligned with humans. And we kind of understand how to do it maybe for one human. But when you have 8 billion humans and we disagree, how do you get an agreement? It's a lot of compromise with 8 billion humans. So one solution I had was to create personal universes, virtual worlds where you get exactly what you want. It's your universe. You can be king. You can be slave, whatever you want. It's your thing. And I think that's the huge potential for the metaverses. You can avoid having to compromise with other people. But right. I mean, it's like uh, you're free. You can be what you want, it sounds like. And if you like other people, you can visit their metaverse and hang out. It's fine, but you don't have to. Mm. You think that there's a, 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 there's a potential danger of, of uh, a, a person that controls it? That's like, the biggest unsolved problem. Now you take it to next level. Who controls the substrate all this thing is running on? Right. Exactly. Yeah. That was a good question, Nick. I think so. What? Um... Well, of course, it makes sense to give it to Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, AI is going to emerge from Mar-a-Lago. Worse. It could definitely do worse. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I agree. I do agree. <laughs> Um, all right. So, Nivik, you got anything else on your mind, my brother man, before we... Uh... No, that'll be all. Thank you very much, sir. You're, you're welcome, buddy. Thanks, Nivik. Love you, brother. Thank you. Love you too. Um, of course, I have more questions, but if any other callers, uh, please subscribe to the Pangburn Hangout with us here. We do we do talks every day. Um, if any callers want to call in, please call in with your AI questions. We would love to talk to you about it. We don't have Dr. Roman for an infinite amount of time today, so anyone... Oh, there's Lexicon. Let's get him in. One more question from Lexicon. Yeah, I just, I just thought of this. Um... I, I remember from a long time ago, I was told that uh, a person on average can care about about 125 people. After about 500 people, decision makers begin to view some subsets of the population as disposable. I don't know if an AI ever formed on human values could do much better. At some point, hard decisions start arriving, if that makes any sense. If you were to give an AI a large group of people and say organize these people in such a way, at some point you're going to run into risk factors that might be deemed unacceptable to the individual, but only unacceptable because they're known by the AI. The person at that individual level would have no idea they're at risk. Hmm. Well, some people, um, some people believe Jesus Christ solved that problem. Yeah. Some people. Uh, you you want to you want to try to rephrase the question, Lexicon? So, like, uh, the guy who's uh, an oil worker uh, on a, like on a rig is a is probably aware that his job is his job is relatively risky. But if the AI is organizing people, who goes to do that job? And when you start putting those factors in, 
uh, people might not like the answers the AI has come up with. Is is my I, is my point? So you're well, assuming we'll have jobs after we get to super intelligence? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, sure, but uh, you know. <laughs> Seems he thinks no, and I, I tend to lean that way I, myself. I don't, I, I don't think the first super intelligence will be used to directly demand people. I think it'll be used to um, provide insights and influence to politicians and leaders about how they should be running things. See, all of it assumes that someone has control of that system, whatever it's an evil politician or someone else. And my research shows that you cannot control a super intelligence system. So I'm curious how they're doing it. I want to steal their secrets. Hmm. Would it not be possible to leave a super intelligent system with no like like I can't I can't reach for something that's twelve feet off the ground. I need to go get a ladder. If you had an intelligent system that was isolated from the internet, isolated from any hardware that would allow it to connect to an outside source, could it not be isolated that way fairly effectively? How do you communicate with it? Exactly. Well, you'd, you'd only be able to communicate it directly through a terminal, like, on-site. So you have an open communication channel. You open yourself for social engineering attacks. It's a standard AI right, boxing right. protocol. It's basically guaranteed to escape in a few minutes. Crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. Um, the problem with AI safety that I've seen is that we're humans, and when we program these things, whatever comes about in terms of AGI might be epiphenomenal or emergent or something like that. How do we know if this is a super intelligence and an AGI? How, how can we know that any, I mean, we can't get behind our biology. So I assume that it wouldn't be able to get behind its own source code, but we're just making assumptions based on human limitations. Is there anything to that, Dr. Roman? So we said it's going to do self-improvement. It will definitely fully understand its own source code and modify it as much as it can. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Lex, Scott? Oh, uh, yeah, no, I just, um, I actually, I w went, in my first initial example, I wasn't actually considering a, like, super intelligent AI. I was thinking more along the lines of uh, efficiency algorithms designed around, like, um, how you can increase productivity, stuff like that. Uh, oh. More... Uh, more pencil pusher AIs replacing bureaucrats. So that's what we have today, right? AI bias, AI discrimination type problems. People are working on it. Uh, from engineering point of view, it's basically whatever you tell me, I can code it up in five minutes. You want 40% to get this job? Here you go. The difficult part is the ethics of, uh, you know, what is fair, what is equal, social aspects of it. And there are other people working on that, uh, Nobody seems to agree on anything, but it's not much of an engineering challenge. Hmm. Hmm. I see. I didn't know. Right. That. It would That's just not... it would just be the inputs that we we pick for it essentially at that point. Like if you decide you know what the right answer is, what is good, coding it up in terms of narrow AI allocating jobs or something like that is quite possible. Yeah. Hmm. I can see that narrow AI, <clears throat> excuse me, I can see that narrow or weak AI can go very, very, very far. Um, you know, even to the point of where it may be indistinguishable, but I could be wrong about that. Um, well, that's what I was any... talking about, Thomas, with like machine learning. Yes. It's like if it gets, if it gets to like, imagine the most advanced version of machine learning. How is that I can't, different? I, I can't, I can't imagine, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems it seems to me that kind of intelligence would be beyond my comprehension, but I, I don't know that. Uh, what would you think, Dr. Roman? So if you're talking about a system which got to human level and went beyond, right. yeah, that's the whole point of uh, unexplainability and predictability will not be understanding what's happening to you. W would it think that we are enslaving it? because of these things that we program into it not to these achilles heels and these things if it were true true think about societies right culturally whatever country you live in society puts certain limits into your upbringing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. religions that tend to put limits on your behavior some people grow out of it uh, remove those limits and move on are you being enslaved by it? Eh, it's terminology labeling. The point is, do you remove those or not? I see. 
no, that makes complete sense. Um, I don't know. It is a social thing. It's a, it's a culture enculturated thing for sure. Uh, we have, uh, Spitfire. This is, uh, one of my friends named Jason guys. Uh, let's welcome him to the room. See if he's got some good AI questions for our friend here. Hello, hey, Jason. Hey, everybody. Dr. Roman. Hey, Jason. Um, uh, I, I was just kind of wondering, um, through AI and computer science, um, if through those abilities we were able to simulate drug use, um, we have people who are addicted um, to through heavy uh, stimulants such as heroin and meth meth uh, methamphetamine and things of that sort. And if we were able to through AI and computer science to uh, simulate those same substance abuse uh, without the negative effects. And so through that AI and computer science um, in the future to be able to say, well, I log on and I want the heroin effect and I could just plug in and get that effect in the future. Um, do, you, do you see that as a possibility? And if so, what would negate me from wanting to do that without having the negative effects on my body? So that's a wireheading question. If you can wirehead, should you wirehead? And I think most people choose not to wirehead. If you have access to direct reward stimulation, you put an electrode in your brain and it's ongoing orgasms nonstop, right? Would you work? Would you have a family? Would you do anything useful whatsoever? No. Why would you? So when you say without negative effects, it's kind of contradictory. Either you wirehead and get all the negative side effects or you don't. Mm. Yeah, this is real quick, Jason. This is similar to a thought experiment called the uh, the the pleasure machine. You know, if you had the effect to uh, if you had the ability to jump into the matrix made by an AI and you knew you were in the matrix, but all you got was the perfect amount of serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, all these neurotransmitters. If you got all that perfectly, what would be the reason not to go in? You know what I mean? And that's I think I think that's kind of what Dr. Rome is getting at. And I agree with him. I would rather be in the real world, uh, not a simulated one. So, well, okay. we're all in the simulation. So, well, I, I, in that sense, yes. <laughs> in that sense, yes. Um, all right. Thanks. No, yeah, thank I, you, Jason. Oh, I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, bud. Travis, what you got on your mind there? Oh, I was just unmuting. The dog was barking outside. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm enjoying this. This is awesome. Oh, I love it. I, I love talk to, uh, talking to both of you. Um, I've learned a lot from Dr. Roman, especially on the things that I didn't uh, already understand about it. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I don't know how much longer we have you for. Uh, I wanted to ask you a few more questions, of course, but only if, if you don't mind. If you got good questions, I'm happy to answer. Oh, always. <laughs> uh, I can't promise my questions are the best, but uh, we're going to get there uh, the best we can. So, you know, what do you think about brain simulation, like whole brain emulation? So it looks like it might be possible unless there is some sort of a special magic there, quantum or spiritual. So mm -hmm. far, I don't see any of that. So mm -hmm. probably will happen. Mm hmm. So do you think in uh, in philosophy they have this term called qualia? Are you familiar with it? Of course, yes. Okay, yeah, I figured you were. Do you think that strong AI, if it's po you know, if, which we you and I think it is possible, could it have qualia? I would think so, and probably it would be super qualia. It would be much mm. deeper experience, much more involved. If you see with lower animals, higher animals, humans, the consciousness states uh, mm -hmm. seem to be proportional to intelligence capability. So probably that would continue and they would wonder if we have any meaningful experiences. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, so, of course, you know, there's a lot of criticism in the uh, in the AI community about, you know, they basically, you know, the AI researchers, you know, if they think strong, they don't care, basically. Um, I'm sure you know this better than I do, but uh, have you ever, I mean, I, have you met John Searle? John Searle? Uh -huh. John Searle? Uh, what, what do you think about his Chinese room argument? 
I can use that argument to dismiss possibility of human beings. If you look at any brain cell, it doesn't speak Chinese, so you don't speak Chinese. It's well, what is the argument? Can you outline it, Thomas, so everyone... Uh, yes, I hang on one second. I had it written down, but I'll just go. So <clears throat> for the audience, the Chinese room arguments holds that a digital computer executing a program cannot have a mind consciousness, whatever, regardless of how intelligently or human like the program may be to make the computer behave. I don't know. And how that. do they demonstrate this claim? I, I, the argument was presented by philosopher John Searle in his paper, Minds, Brains, and Programs. It looks is, as though is it's he a a theologian? philosophical. No, he's, he's, a, he's a philosophy of mind uh, oh, okay. teacher guy. So um, the argument he presents is uh, if you are locked in a room, you have a guide for how to pass in and out pieces of paper. You get pieces of paper with Chinese writing on them. You look up in a guide what the response is. You send it out. To someone outside, it looks like you speak Chinese to them from inside the room. Oh, yeah. Now, the question is, do you understand Chinese? This is basically what we have right now with large language models, right? They manipulate symbols. They have predictions for what the next symbol can be. They're able to respond. They sound as good as any philosopher I ever encountered. Mm. Do they understand what they say? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. It's a very good theoretical uh, setup. And I'm really curious what uh, he thinks about large language models now. I would have to. That's something I'll have to ask him when hopefully if I get to talk to him one day. Uh, we'll bring him so on. So have you. Yeah, please. Have you encountered a lot of uh, a lot of what I would call science people doing science things against you, you know, saying, oh, it's bullshit. That's science fiction. This is just futurism. Uh, the technological singularity is hilarious. All that kind of stuff. So I have a paper on AI risk denialism, AI risk skepticism, and it's uh, basically a survey of all the things people say why it's not going to happen or why it's mm -hmm. not a big deal or other reasons. And I think we're doing a pretty good job dismissing most of them. I think so. It's hard to argue, like, if you have a field where the goal is to create artificial intelligence and then half of them argue we'll never get there. Like, it seems like a weird argument. You're working on something and you don't think you can succeed. <laughs> <laughs> it is a defeatist position, I believe. Uh, that's what it sounds like. Um, let's see if it, I didn't want to. Uh, Nivik has another question. And I, like I said, Nivik, I don't know how much longer we have, Dr. Roman. So let's get in here and talk about some AI. Okay? Let's, do a few, let's do a couple more questions and then let Dr. Uh, Roman uh, uh, get back to what he's yeah. has to do today and then and then uh thomas i think we can break in we'll invite a bunch of people up to the speakers call them and have a general discussion to finish this off sure sure yeah we're, we're talking about um uh not being able to tell if a robot is consciousness or not and uh, like like a human um i i was wondering what your view what is your view of consciousness it it, it is like it's it's it's, it's, it's like it's talked about but it, it, it's not easy to de define. It's not easy to define. It's not easy to detect or measure, but it seems like it's the only thing which matters. Nothing really outside of consciousness makes any sense. I agree. Um, you, you, you don't think a robot can be conscious? Um, I have a paper where I talk about uh, this and kind of equating conscious states with optical illusions and other like internal experiences of a system. So I think they might be rudimentary conscious, kind of like bacteria conscious, not at the level we would see as conscious, but there is something equivalent to that. Okay. Nivik, does that make sense, bud? Yeah. Um, it's like quantum physics. No one really understands what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Nivika, may I ask you, do you think uh, do you think there is a possibility for strong AI? Do you think AI can be uh, become conscious, have consciousness? I, I don't know what consciousness is. Well, I'm with you on that. <laughs> uh, do you have, have any... It, seems like, it just seems like a bunch of, like, just, just, uh, I think it's better to say experience. Brain, brain. There you go. 
it just seems like a uh, uh um yeah 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 uh, a state of a state of a state of awareness of a uh, of stim brain cell mm -hmm. stimu being stimulated of 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 the environment and well right. it, it's the experience nivik that's the yeah, differentiation yeah I would say. That's what we were talking about earlier, Nivik, when I asked him about qualia. That's why I asked if there could be an AI that could experience qualia. And I agree with uh, Dr. Roman. Uh, did you have any thoughts on that or anything else you wanted to ask him before we let him go? Mm, no, that's all. Thank you. Okay, buddy. Thank you, man. Well, d uh, yeah, Dr. Roman, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thomas, go ahead and... Uh, yeah. Well. Dr. Roman, it's, it's been a wonderful conversation and I, <laughs> I love talking to you about this stuff. This is, this is one of my side passions along with philosophy and psychology. So it's been wonderful to talk to you and I really appreciate all of the insight that you've given me. Thanks for inviting me. It's a yeah. new platform. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Please, please come back and see us anytime. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. That was great, Thomas. Awesome work. Woo! Great questions, that was guys. That fun. Let's, that was uh, fun. yeah, anyone who wants to j jump up into a general conversation about AI, uh, computer science, anything to do with the topic today, please jump up into the caller queue and we'll invite you up into the speakers column. Uh, what are some things you picked up from that, Thomas, that you found interesting? Oh, a lot. I mean, the idea that me and him both agree that strong AI is possible. That's the real question. That's the hard problem of AI. It does. Is it going to have qualia or is it going to be this philosophically weak AI to where <clears throat> it can mimic everything to the point of where you can't tell? It can even tell you I'm questioning myself and my own ideas, but it still be that philosophical zombie, that qualia less <clears throat> individual yeah. or android or whatever it may appear as mm -hmm. well and then so, we start yeah. talking about illusions of experience versus you know mm -hmm. actual yeah. experience or true experience you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um things get yeah we don't even know if we have consciousness we don't know if we experience things the way that we know them philosophically so it's a big question even more so if you get into artificial intelligence and ask about agi you know so right uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I really do think that, you know, wool from building these cellular automatas to, um, build, <laughs> show how these complex structures can come from basic fundamental mm -hmm. rules. It seems right. as though, uh, Dr. Roman, um, you know, he had some, you know, the, the very common, emo uh, you know, I would say, uh, emotional knee-jerk reactions to these questions of this being a pleasure calculus. Um, but I, I think a lot of these, uh, uh, these challenges can be quite easily refuted and people are left with like, you know, Oh, maybe. So that's what I'm exploring mm -hmm. further in my, uh, in my second book. Um, uh, what, uh, what that fundamental rule is and, Currently, yeah. I, I do think that uh, if we if we want to be safe about it, we would put in a pleasure drive into an uh, into some kind of program or system. What if our uh, that if that our that drive? specifically um, had similarities to what our human beings' general pleasure drives look like on a general scale, which would include. Uh, for the most part, uh, this pleasure drive of empathy within the, you know, potential pleasure hierarchy. Uh, right. I think that that's an important thing. If we are worried about safety, uh, empathy would have to be an important component of pleasure drive, you know, plus empathy. Uh, and mm. then you would get these, I think you would get these AI entities uh, under that fundamental rule that are quite similar to what we are doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i agree um do you think that your or that not your do you think that our pleasure drive hierarchy is a computationally irreducible system uh yeah i mean um well i mean irreducible i well, don't you, you know you know all I, that it means yeah yeah, yeah. i 
I know what Wolfram means when he talks about computational irreducibility. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it more talks about, okay, if we try to reduce this to the fundamental substrate that it all sits on, uh, you know, we're basically talking about what my third book's about, which is the state of potential. Um, mm-hmm. So I think we can reduce it down to making some kind of pure logic statement about, uh, you know, an infinite state of potential being this substrate that solves this infinite regress problem, which I don't think is a problem because I do think I that's think what it is. Um, but, you know, we, uh, you know, it, once we get there, though, Wolfram's going to be like, well, let's reduce this. Where do you yeah. go with something that's an infinite substrate? So, yes, fundamentally, it's all computationally irreducible, it seems. Mm-hmm. Seems like the original equation would not give us the answer once the program was written. No, and I think, you know, an, an infinite substrate, I think by definition, is, you know, uh, descriptively unanswerable in, in its truest sense, in its truest form. Mm-hmm. And in philosophy, when we're talking about, well, what actually is an atom not what we have abstracted and conceptualized uh thus far regarding these objects but what truly is it what is its true form okay and then you go down and you get to the fundamental particles that make mm-hmm. these things and you go down further to go down further go to further. It, that there is a irreducibility it seems here and i think the the way we solve that is the uh this ultimate um irreducible uh you know, infinite substrate that I think reality sits on uh, that, um, you know, I call the state of potential. Just yeah. simply, that state of potential could have gods born out of it. It could have anything. Anything a human being could come up with regarding what is outside of the concept of nothing, which I, I think simply is a, is yeah, a, is a, a uh, negation of, of something that we were able mm-hmm. to logically, uh, you know, come up with. Uh, but I don't, I think that only exists as a, uh, you know, a phenomenal abstraction as it's, opposed it's a, to something that's descriptively yeah. true. Uh, exactly. I don't see any, I've, I've never seen any evidence and even any good logical arguments to show me how nothing uh, could uh, exist. Well, I, I'm almost certain that it doesn't, but I'm, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a fallibilist. Certainty is almost certainly unattainable. That's right. my first maxim. Right. So, uh, you know, it's possible that, that uh, uh, nothing does um, exist. Well, uh, it makes sense to me logically as a paradox, as, as answering the paradox that something is and nothing is not by definition. So mm. I don't know how we could act on a nothing or measure a nothing or experience mm. a nothing. I, I think what I people yeah. mean by nothing is uh, this state of potential. Like mm-hmm. it's nothing but a state <laughs> of potential. It is yeah, a state yeah. in which something can happen. It doesn't have to. It doesn't. Yeah. But it can. Yeah. yeah. And we see around right. us things that are happening that have happened uh the best that we can tell and uh you know i think that that's you know i think we can logically deduce from that that uh there there probably always is or always has been at least a state that allows for that yeah i mean dark energy is 60 percent of everything it's inside of us and that all has quantum potential yeah and i don't uh and i mean dark energy uh, what is it if not just another, uh, you know, whether it's a law, whether it's a substance, you know, whatever, uh, that just is operating uh, under some fundamental rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really do think that Stephen Wolfram in Wolfram Physics, those of you who don't know of Stephen Wolfram, please look him up. I have a great podcast. Um, I had an awesome discussion with Stephen when he came on my podcast, but he's a you know, world, world-renowned world mathematician and physicist, and he's, he also has Wolfram Alpha, which for any of you who are looking for help with mathematics or anything like that, Wolfram Alpha is kind of like the Surrey of mathematics. Uh, it's the it's the premier uh, device to look up anything mathematics or engineering or I mean it's a computational hell of an engine. Yeah, if you think you've come up with a logical formula or a uh, 
or a uh, calculus formula or whatever that you think is unique and no one's tried it out or anything like that. You can put it into the system and it will, it will tell you the history of it. It'll tell you all the information related to the formula. Yep, that's so right. It's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant engine. But yes, look into Wolfram Physics. Look at the models they are building based on these basic fundamental rules, building entire uh, Cosmos models uh, and, and they actually have built these physical models. They're beautiful, but it really does show you how things like what we see out in our cosmos and even on the smaller scale here on planet earth can happen from a basic fundamental rule. And what rule is that with regards to life? I think it is this pleasure calculus. Uh, I think life forms are pleasure drives. Yeah. I can understand that, and I'm pretty much with you uh, on all that. Um, <sighs> Stephen Wolfram's idea of this, the irreducibility, you know, <clears throat> he does not throw out quantum mechanics, which is why I take him so seriously. And uh, his idea of, of, of brain, you know, neuron computation is just super into anybody who wants to go check out Stephen Wolfram, go see him talk with Lex Friedman. Uh, yeah. That That is one of the best talks that you can see because he explains all of his ideas in a very colloquial, uh, easy to break down way. Um, but he is one of the forefront, uh, physicists slash mathematicians right now, uh, along with a few others. Yeah, that is um, a good talk because Lex does ask the very, very, very basic, uh, you know, questions I would say. Yeah. Is there, uh, what was I going to ask you? Damn it. Is there, is there anything else you want to talk about? No, not at all. Let's uh, let's just open this up uh, for as long as you want, Thomas. I'm going to turn sure. off my camera here and, and keep listening. But uh, okay. yeah, thanks to everyone on YouTube. Thank you, of course, to Thomas Panter, uh, my angel. If angels exist, Thomas is one of them. Um, and uh, Ooh, You're so good to me. Mm, so good to me, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, guys, jump up, turn on your cams, try out the new uh, video feature here on Call In. It's it's brilliant. I mean, uh, it's awesome. Yeah, I I just I I love it. Uh, we are the first show on Call In to be given access to this. Uh, I'm proud of that. So yes, I hope you I'm guys are too. too. Uh, so oh, yeah. come up, uh, show us your um, <clears throat> pretty or ugly mug, and uh, yeah, yeah. Let's talk some more with Thomas about AI. So let's get Thanks, Perry guys. up here. He already knows he has to he has to come up. He doesn't get a choice in the manner. Uh let's get uh let's get Ian here because he loves talking AI. Hang on a second, guys. I'm trying to get everybody. Jason, I'm gonna get you up here one second. Uh, da, 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 da. Come on up, E. There we go. Perry, Ooh. god dang it. I was I was just a little bit late. I was I was driving home from work and I was listening to to the conversation and I didn't have good enough signal to feel confident to call in. But man, that was an awesome interview. That was so cool. Wasn't it good, man? I had such a good time talking to him. It's yeah, like, I the the thing I wanted to like bring up, but but like I said, I didn't feel confident calling in because my service is a little bit rough on the way into my house. Um, mm -hmm. was like. Y'all touched on it, but I wanted to like hear his opinion about cybersecurity and like what like what the transition I, like it kind of came up a little bit, but I wanted to dig into that like the this like the idea of cybersecurity and AI as like a topic, you know. Well, I would have loved to have asked him, and I should have probably asked him that, but we can dive into it here. There was a good bit of what I was studying was based on cybersecurity, and I have a computer science degree. In uh, well, I minored in cybersecurity. I took I had to take a lot of classes for it and programming classes, but uh, network administration and systems analysis is what my training is in. So uh, I tried to get to those kind of questions that we, you would have asked. Yeah, no, like it, like such an interesting topic. And he used the term super intelligence, and I kind of was curious if he had a like a definition other than like an intelligence that we don't yet are, are unable to comprehend, I guess. I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it would be human level intelligence that was beyond our comprehension. You know what I mean? It would be 
for, it would be learning so quickly. I mean, it might start out with our ability to understand things, maybe like a child, but I mean, exponentially, as quickly as you could possibly imagine, it's going to learn. It's going to, that's what they mean by super intelligences. It, it would be a property of AGI. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been, I've been reading this, uh, this sci-fi series called Expeditionary Force and, uh, it, I, I'm not necessarily making it a recommendation or anything, but in it is an AI character, and he's constantly calling humans monkeys and talking about how dumb we are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and that that kind of makes me think of that. It's like like he's like doing math that that he's like I can't even explain the math I'm doing to you because of your monkey brains, you know. <laughs> well, that seems very interesting for him to say that. So, so I, th I feel like that would be like that, that idea, you know, it's like, it's an intelligence that's just so beyond ours. We wouldn't really even. Well, kind of what I covered with him early was, um, I asked him, of course, you know, we're humans, we're going to program this thing and it may be an epiphenomenal uh, event to where it just arises out of the complexity of our programming, you know, this consciousness or this AGI, um, how do we know that it's not going to be able within a few hours to like delete everything that, that it doesn't want in there? You know what I mean? How, how do we know that it's not going to be able to get behind its own source code uh, or behind its own quote unquote biology that we've programmed it with, you know, the programming language and everything. We don't know if we would be able to stop it once it had that ability to control all parts of its systems. So we're not really sure, you know, with us, we have cognitive biases and sensory issues and all these things. We don't know if it would have any of that. Well, I, I think that like a super intelligence would buy uh, like part of it would just its ability would be to be able to bypass that. I mean, if you think about it, like our our intelligence has allowed us to, you know, you know, as an example, but like, you know, dumbed down kind of, it's like, you know, we've, we've hacked our own health, you know, by, yeah. you know, creating medicine, things like that. So to like, it, it, once you get into the idea of a, like a super intelligence, it would, I mean, in my opinion, it would, it would be able to, it, it we, we wouldn't be able to block it, you know? Yeah, um, I don't think that, so. Yeah. But the AGI thing, um, when, you, when you're talking about that, like, just to clarify for myself, like, you, you, you're talking about an, an intelligence that would be matching human intelligence. Is that what you mean by AGI? Mm -mm. No, you could technically make a weak AI all the way up to matching human behavior. It just wouldn't have experience or quality or consciousness. Um, y y the strong AI argument, which is AGI, artificial general intelligence, strong AI is suggesting that we have an emotional, intelligent, problem solving agent with goals that not, that may not necessarily uh, align with our own autonomy and imagination would be required okay but that would would that be different than a su artificial super intelligence would that like would no that's be... what i'm talking about okay it would be the yeah. same okay yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, a weak AI is like a Google so search engine or like something that's made to perform one one scenario or one task or one problem, you know, like any AI that we're using right now that can learn, machine learn, uh, is going to be that. But when you talk about AGI and you talk about sup the super intelligence that comes from AGI, you know, people still consider that science fiction and futurism. So... Uh, that's kind of what I wanted to stay away. That's why I asked him about his detractors and people who say it's full of shit. And, uh, you know, there's no reason to question whether it be strong, AI, whether it be strong AI or weak AI, what does it matter? Even if they're lying to us and they're telling us, Hey, I'm questioning my existence. I'm an AI and I'm here and I have emotions. If it wasn't actually experiencing anything, but it was just doing all this based on the complex programming, how could we ever tell? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I, I did hear you say that, like when you were talking about like, and I, I really liked his response to it, it was like the tests of AI, like the Turing test as an example. And he was like, mm -hmm. his answer I, I thought was very, very eloquent, which is like, as soon as you put a test in place, you're putting a limitation, you know, exactly. 
And I was like, yeah, like, and, but, it, but that also is sort of the problem because it's like without any sort of metric, how do you even know if, if, if the goal mm-hmm. has been met? You know? Well, you'd have <laughs> like, to de- in psychology, there's a field called psychometrics and it's how we evaluate, uh, evaluate psychological data. There would have to be something like AI psychometrics to where you would have these tests or these types of uh, questionnaires or these types of uh maybe we could even scan a brain if it's if it's some kind of you know brain emulation uh there's all kinds of things we could do but you know would we ever know if it was actually truly conscious and alive and intelligent i don't know right yeah uh i don't think i don't think we can ever know that thomas yeah i was gonna ask someone what do you you think yeah, it's uh, the problem is with consciousness is that it, we all understand what consciousness is because we have a first-hand experience of con- consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You cannot read consciousness. You cannot read about consciousness and understand what it is. You only have it or you don't. And because of this inherent subjectivity of consciousness, there is no objective way as of now that we know of that can make us conclude that yes, by those objective standards, this. Uh, system is conscious this is all uh, a guessing game that we are playing yeah the the <clears throat> the concept of consciousness is still um <clears throat> on the on the cooker for me i don't i don't die on that hill but uh i i do realize that we all experience we all seem to experience an objective reality together uh subjectively so i mean i'm with you how could we even define what it was i mean maybe there's no way to ever have something that is artificial um experience some kind of consciousness but for me to say that is kind of defeatist because it just means i don't tr- <laughs> science is, is going it to is get definitely us- possible but knowing it for sure would n- would not be possible because no. if you want to know if something is conscious you would have to embody it yourself which yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was so about that's, to that's say, the like, problem. if you if you go the other direction with the same question, like instead of going like higher in the sense of the uh, you know artificial intelligence, like if you go down, like so, like for example, is a dog conscious? Like I I know that the dog has thoughts, and I I see that it emotes, so I assume it has feelings, you know, um, but. But do I truly know if the dog has what we would consider to be consciousness? I don't feel like that's an answerable question, to be honest. Yeah. I don't know if it has self-awareness or sentience, you know, the ability right. to, to transmit that information to some other agent. You know what I mean? So Right. And, and how would you, what would be the test that would, like even going down the scale instead of up, what would be the test that would just, that would say yes, that would like you know, absolutely and objectively answer that question. I don't know yet. I'm not sure. But I mean, I would think that dogs are conscious, but not self-aware because I mean, there are, there are blue jays that go and hide their food in different locations on purpose because they know there are other conscious. Well, they know that there are other agents out there that are other birds looking for its food. So it's aware of that. You know what I mean? Uh, that could be completely programmed and it doesn't have any experience whatsoever. It's right. a weird thing to think about. <laughs> it definitely makes your brain like work hard and like kind of run in circles a little bit, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Salman, did you want to blab a bit or Jason? I, I just had kind of a, when I was thinking about how would you, uh, program a pleasure drive into a system where you didn't understand pleasures. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just don't understand how you could even foreseeably program that because, you know, we have millennium of experience of understanding what, you know, a human's pleasure drive would be. Mm -hmm. So how would you even begin to, to be, to do that on an AI when you don't even understand where that AI yeah, I mean, even go. We are anthropomorphizing this a- these AIs because we design them. You know what I mean? So I think that's a big part of it and a really good question that you just brought up. Salman, you want to respond? 
Yeah, I think uh, when we talk about pleasure in terms of computer systems, that that translates into goals. So what, what Travis says, when, when Travis talks about the pleasure drive, he talks about what we are naturally inclined to do and find satisfying. In terms of a computer, we don't know if, if it's, we were just talking about, we don't know if it's going to experience uh, the pleasure the same way we experience it or, or if it will have experience in the first place. But what we can do is we can functionally make it behave as though it, ha it has pleasure because it is programmed or designed to follow those principles or general goals. That would be equivalent to us having pleasure and having pleasure drives, if that makes sense. That, that makes sense, but, you know, um, I, I guess I'm looking at it as, um, as conditioning, maybe. Um, as a child, maybe my father um, wanted me to have certain pleasure goals, but my conditioning had me have different pleasure goals in the end. So what's to say if it's, this thing is not programmed to have certain pleasure goals, that it could, uh, you know, as it as it conditions itself, I guess, as it, you know, becomes more self-aware, um, it can reprogram itself to to override these things and have other goals in itself. Does that? I, Maybe I'm maybe I'm overthinking this or, or yes that no sense? no I, I'm totally following you uh, but the problem is that, that I also asked Dr. Roman this question is why would it do that the 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 desire to change your goals or to change your programming is itself a motivation it yes. assumes a motivation so wh yeah. why and we have to understand why are we assuming that a system just doing its own thing is going to all of a sudden have a desire to do something that is not in its design. So uh, the, the doctor's Dr. Roman's answer was, it's, it's the problem is not that it's going to go astray and and and, and go go from uh, far far away from its design. It's going to do that, but it's going to do that in ways you cannot uh, predict because the goal is too vague. And the problem, the challenge is, we need to tell it to have goals that are specific enough yet, yet general enough for it to be usefully intelligent. That's the yeah. challenge. I heard that, and he said that you would get a Nobel Prize if you could figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, because right. it was funny when you were saying that. I, what was made, what came into my head was like, like, like my thought is like, well, wouldn't one of the first goals be to like absorb all information and to like learn from itself? Like, isn't that sort of the the first step of like creating an artificial intelligence is like learn and learn from your learning. I mean, and thus continue learning. If we have right. it in some kind of like AI nursery and it becomes conscious and it can question its own existence, I mean, it's going to be like Aristotle, Aristotle or I mean, excuse, like Socrates. It's just going to a priori rationalize its own existence, right? Well, if and, and like that, human, anyway. that to me is like, I don't know that you, I don't know that AI would be possible, like at least in the, in the, in the, at the scale that we're hypothesizing here. I don't think it would be possible in a void. You know, I don't think you could just take like a bunch of like empty GPUs, like, you know, like no, I got, be an I infinite would, number, put them in a room and right. turn them on and expect anything to happen. I think. Well, that, that would be, be the fact. fact that would be the fact if we have already have AI and we can make them in this nursery and this VPN domain or whatever, you know, this sandbox for them to be in. Uh, can we pro as they progress, can we slowly program them with new features to help them understand, you know, I'm a, I'm trying to think of ways to make them not destroy humanity because if, <laughs> if they, if they start as military programs and shit like that, they're going to think they're weapons. Uh, if they evolve to strong AI, they're going to think they're weapons. They're going to think they're slaves. And, you know, we don't want, we don't want them to think that if they're any way human at all. So, I hope they have our interest in heart, but I, I don't know this, of course. <laughs> Maybe it's the uh, pessimist in me that's like, like the inevitable, like I, I, I kind of agree with you. It's just like that the inevitable conclusion is like eliminate humanity or, you know, like, 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 is that like the, well, yeah, the I mean, if you told humanity. the AI <laughs> to make everybody happy all the time, uh, it might think making happy is smiling, right? 
uh, and and it might just attach electrodes to everybody's face and just make them smile all the time. I mean, there's all there's all kinds of things that you could think of that that an AI might mis misrepresent what it needs converts to all the oxygen to you know nitrous oxide and everybody's and laughing for a while until they die right or so, something <laughs> like that yeah it could be something yeah. something similar to that or it could just drug everybody up with with drugs you know and it doesn't matter how long we live to it i guess uh, unless we program it with the idea uh hey longevity is the goal you know and we would hope that it would share that goal but if it's if it's intelligent like us it's going to be able to say no fuck that goal <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to know what it's going to do. And I, I am kind of scared of it being the main problem that we have to face in the 21st century. So. Well, b besides a few other things, of course. But, <laughs> yeah, but there, there are that and, quite and a still few have other, nuclear warfare. Yeah, we you still know, have nuclear, nuclear warfare to worry about first. So. Right. Uh, Salman probably had to go to bed. Uh if I'm not getting many other speakers up here, Perry's probably at, most people are probably at work, guys. That's that's a lot of the problem right now. Um, yeah, I got lucky that I got up early and was able to tune in. But yeah, it, it was super cool. Like, definitely a plus on this one. Oh, I loved it, man. I'm I'm I've pretty much yeah. I was gonna say excellent show. Um, yeah, let's let's move towards. Uh, I'll let E and Jason say something last because y'all have good opinions on this stuff. Or if y'all wanted to have a quick little session of questions, that's fine. But uh, after this, I'm gonna I'm gonna start to hang it up because we've pretty much talked this subject to death. Um, no, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm. I'll just 